This is a map of the world's agricultural lands with croplands in green and grazing lands in orange. Together, croplands and grazing lands occupy a third of our world's ice-free land surface. That's a huge footprint on the land by just one species and creating all of the environmental problems that you already know about. So this is a major challenge. How do we improve food security while lowering the environmental footprint of agriculture? And solutions, commonly pro proposed solutions to this challenge typically focus on the supply side. Um, and I've done research in this space uh, for many years, and today I'll be examining two of them, um, sustainable intensification and organic farming. These are two commonly proposed solutions, and I'm going to ask, you know, how much can be done? How, what is possible with these solutions? Look at sustainable intensification. We first have to talk about um, what are known as um, yield gaps, um, which is the idea that farmers around the world can improve their yields simply by mimicking what the best farmers are doing. This usually requires improving their management practices and possibly adding more inputs, adding more nutrients or adding more water. So by closing these, for closing these yield gaps, typically you need to add more nutrients and water, which is good for yields, but it's not so good for the environment. So sustainable intensification essentially asks, how can we close yield gaps around the world while at the same time at, uh, lowering the environmental footprint? How can we improve yields at lower environmental costs? Right. So this map shows you such a solution for nitrogen, uh, for nitrogen fertilizer application. With nitrogen fertilizer use, we have what um, I often call a Goldilocks problem. In some places in the world, we are not applying enough nitrogen. In the other places in the world, we are applying excess nitrogen. So in this particular solution, um, in the map that you see, places in red are places where we think we can improve, we can add more nitrogen and get improvements in yields. Um, these, you may think of these as places where people are underperforming. While there are places in green, like the Midwestern US, um, Western Europe, uh, parts of China, uh, where we can actually decrease nitrogen fertilizer use. In these places, currently, we have excess nitrogen fertilizer, and with only a marginal uh, hit on uh, crop yields. So putting these kinds of solutions together, um, in this particular study, we estimated that we can increase uh, production by about 30% with only a 10% increase in nitrogen. So that's sustainable intensification for you. Can we do, essentially trying to do things more efficiently. Now I'm going to turn to organic farming, um, which is a commonly believed um, solution for solving our food system problems. I personally also believe in organic farming. I believe in the power of it. Um, I purchase and support organic farming. Uh, but a few years ago, a student of mine and I started doing some research on this. Um, and again, we need to look at both the uh, you know, the, how much food can organic produce, as well as its environmental problems. So we did a study first where we wanted to compare the yields of organic compared to conventional agriculture. Um, and we looked across the world and we found 66 different studies that uh, scientists have done comparing organic farms next to conventional farms. Um, when we put these data together and we looked at the relative yields, um, we found that organic yields on average were lower by about 25% compared to conventional yields. We also found that there was a lot of context dependency on this. Um, in, under some conditions, organic did much better, and other conditions, organic did worse. But I won't get into those details right now. When we looked at the environmental impacts on organic, on the other hand, we found that organic fared pretty well. Um, this uh, rather ugly flower diagram um, shows that uh, in, in this flower diagram, the petals of the flowers, if they are outside that circle, it means organic is better. So across a whole range of issues like biodiversity, soil health, nutrient loss, or climate change, we found that organic fares better, except for one case with methane emissions. So overall, organic seems to fare better for the environment, uh, but it has a cost in terms of yields. So there seems to be a trade-off with organic better for the environment, but lower yields. When we put these together into some kind of an assessment here, where the top row shows how much food can be produced, the other four rows looks at different environmental outcomes of interest. With sustainable intensification, don't worry about the numbers, just look at the colors. Green means better, red means worse. 
With sustainable intensification, you can produce more food, but you still have environmental costs. You can do it efficiently, but you still need to add more, more inputs. With organic, you have environmental benefits, but you have a trade-off with yields. So neither of these solutions seems to do what we want. We want to you know, improve food production, but we also want to do it while reducing its environmental costs. So after having done this research for over a decade, I've started thinking that you know, supply-side solutions, maybe we are fiddling at the margins. We, we can have it all. And I've increasingly started believing that we need to start thinking about demand-side solutions, uh, that we can solve this problem just through supplying more food. Remember the first map that I showed you where I had the world's croplands, so all those places in green? Well, all the crops that we grow, only about 55% of those calories are actually given to humans directly. About 10% is lost to biofuels and other industrial pro products. Of 36%, more than a third of our world's crops are fed to animals. And because of the biology of how those animals work, only 4% in calories is, actually comes back to humans. So humans get only about 60%, 55 plus 4, as, ca as calories. So we have to remember that we don't grow food on this planet, we really grow crops and commodity crops for a large part. This shows the same thing in a map form. So again, think about the world's croplands. Um, you saw, saw it in green colors, and now you have two colors. Um, places in red are places um, where only a small fraction, so this map essentially shows what proportion of the world's crop production goes to human food calories, human food production. All the places in red are places where only 10 to uh, 20, 30 percent of the crop calories are actually going to food, food calories. So some of the best places in the world to grow uh, crops, the Midwestern US, Western Europe, places with really good climates, really good soils, we are devoting a tiny proportion of that towards growing food. This study estimated that if everyone became vegan, we could have an increase in calories by about 70%. So that's a huge bang for the buck. That doesn't mean that you all need to become vegan. It means that if you stop eating meat one day a week, you can contribute to 10% of the solution. So that's a big leverage. Demand-side solutions also have a double effect, what I often call a double whammy. So let's say that the blue color is the, uh, the blue bar shows the amount of food we have today, and the line above that shows the 2050 target. A supply-side solution simply tries to produce more food to meet that gap. But with a demand-side solution, because everyone is shifting their diets, let's say, um, it depresses the 2050 target, so we have less to achieve looking forward into the future, but at the same time, it frees up calories today, calories that we are currently using to di diverting towards food. So it depresses what's needed in the future, it also frees up new calories today, so it has a double effect. If you, if you leverage demand-side solutions at the same time, it means that there is less for supply-side solutions to do. There, we need to this challenge of closing yield gaps and so on. We have less of that to do. Uh, we can maybe embrace something like organic agriculture and be fine with its lower yield costs. So this is what uh, uh, I call soft paths. And I have to pay homage to Emery Levins. Uh, if people work in the energy field, you will recognize this name. Back in the 1970s, Emery Levins uh, wrote a book on soft energy paths. And he recognized that when people talk about energy solutions, they typically talk about technological solutions, you know, building more coal-fired plants or building more hydroelectric or whatever you may be. And he argued that if we manage demand, if we manage demand-side solutions and couple them with supply-side solutions, that can work much better towards achieving our energy goals. Um, people have adopted the same idea to, to looking at water management. It's, it's, uh, it's the same thing. If you, leak a if you fix a leaky pipe, it reduces water consumption today, but it also reduces water consumption in the future. So what does a soft path for sustainable foods look like for a sustainable food system? I think, again, borrowing an analogy from energy systems, I think there are three elements to it. One is just reducing the overall demand for food um, through re reducing dietary excess, um, moving towards more plant-based foods, or, and, di and not diverting as much of our food uh, to biofuels and other products. It also 
involves improving efficiency, uh, both on the supply side by improving water and nutrient use efficiency, as well as reducing efficient, uh, improving efficiency by re um, reducing food loss and waste. And then finally, adopting more environmentally friendly agriculture, uh, whether it's organic or agroecological, conservation agriculture, regenerative agriculture, more diversified farming systems, whatever, whatever they may be. These kinds of solutions actually resemble the Eat Lancet report fairly well. These recommendations are quite similar. And so another way to think about it is that no matter how you look at this problem, the solutions we seem to come up with seem to be similar. So thank you very much. Let's make agriculture great again.